If you're going to mediation soon or you have clients who are, consider pre-mediation coaching with us at High Conflict Institute. This is a brand new service we're providing and here's why. Most people are unsure what will happen in mediation and how to prepare for it, especially in a high conflict mediation. Studies show that regardless of the skill level of your mediator, learning a few key conflict resolution skills can increase your success of settling your matter out of court. Our pre-mediation coach will work with you in a 90-minute one-on-one session by Zoom or phone to help you learn to stay calm, to make reasonable proposals, and make decisions that can last. A small investment with significant positive outcomes. Schedule your pre-mediation coaching session on our website at the link below in the show notes or call us at 619-800-2070. If you're a lawyer, mediator, or other professional and want more info, just ask us at highconflictinstitute.com on our contact page or feel free to provide the coaching link directly to your clients today. Welcome to It's All Your Fault on True Story FM, the one and only podcast dedicated to helping you identify and deal with the most damaging humans, people with high conflict personalities. I'm Megan Hunter, and I'm here with my co-host, Bill Eddy. Hi, everybody. We're glad to have you listening. And we're the co-founders of the High Conflict Institute in San Diego, California. In today's episode, we're going to define and talk about just who are high conflict people. But first, we have a few quick reminders. Here's the deal. We want to hear from you. Have you dealt with a high conflict situation, been blamed, experienced violence or abuse from an HCP? Or maybe you simply dread seeing that person again, but you probably have to at home tonight or at work tomorrow. Send us your questions and we just might discuss them on the show. You can submit them by clicking the Submit a Question button on our website at highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast, or emailing us at podcast at highconflictinstitute.com, or just drop us a note on any of our socials. You can find all the show notes and links at highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast as well. Make sure you subscribe, rate, and review, and please tell all your friends about us. Telling just one person that you like the show and where they can find it is the best way you can help us out and help more people learn how to address high conflict people. We appreciate you so very, very much. And now on with the show. Have you ever been targeted by a blamer? Dismissed by a narcissist? Experienced extreme wrath and rage? Or intensely emotional people? If so, you may have been dealing with a person with a high conflict personality. Those who don't connect the dots back to their own behavior. We're here to help you understand the 10% who do things that 90% of other people would never do. Now let's get started. So it's no surprise to anyone that we're living in an ever-increasing society of conflict. And, you know, conflict is normal. We learn to manage conflict throughout life and, and mostly do okay with our interactions with other people. But most of us have come across a person who seemed a little outside the norm when it comes to conflict. Maybe you've experienced someone like this, like a blamer, right? Maybe you've been the target of blame or had a false accusation lodged against you or public shaming on social media, or even cancellation. I'm betting you were taken by surprise and either overreacted or just didn't know how to react. And that's pretty normal. It's very typical. It's all about the brain. What we're talking about here are people with a high conflict personality. These are people who don't stop themselves before doing something that 90% of other people would never do. Unconstrained texting, phone calls, emails, and social media. If you've experienced this, you know exactly what we're talking about. These are folks with a high conflict personality. They're different. However, the, part of the problem is that we don't encounter them too often, you know, depending on our situation. So we end up applying the same strategies with them as we do with everyone else. We take a one-size-fits-all solution, but it doesn't work with HCPs. So let me share a quick example with you. I was giving a training to a group of lawyers. 
After many years of giving this type of training to lawyers and other professionals, my experience was always positive. So I was surprised when during the break at this particular training, one of the participants tapped me on the shoulder while I was getting my coffee and asked to speak to me. So I stepped aside and and uh, you have to understand when I am speaking or giving a training, I get kind of a little high because I really enjoy what I do. And, and so I'm, I'm kind of happy and, and think that everybody else is happy too. <laughs> so I'm, you know, combine that with being eager to answer questions and talk with people during the breaks. Um, I, you know, my expectation of the conversation is that it would be positive. Instead, this person started by saying, I may be the highest conflict person in the room. <laughs> because I was a little bit high, um, speaker high, I gave a little laugh and thinking this person was joking. And that really seemed seemed to kind of provoke some anger with, I am the highest conflict person in the room, <laughs> all caps, exclamation mark. And the, you know, the face was really close to my face and the face was red and, you know, a lot of anger and um, the voice was escalated. So I froze right? Um, and I only remember being accused of wasting their time and money by attending this training. Now, after training hundreds, if not thousands of attorneys and other professionals, I knew this wasn't usual behavior. <laughs> so, Bill, let's dig in. You're the guy who figured this out a couple of decades ago. So you're the one that's uniquely qualified to help our listeners understand why and how HCPs, those with a high conflict personality, are different. Well, they can start with that 90% you were talking about, Megan. But what we see is they really catch people by surprise. It's like, oh, my goodness. And we become like deer in the headlights. We don't know what to do because we're not used to people totally blaming us. It's all your fault. So what we've learned is that people like this actually have a narrow pattern of behavior, which is actually quite predictable. So they preoccupied with blaming others. They say it's all your fault. They take zero responsibility for a problem. They have a lot of all or nothing thinking. They often have unmanaged emotions, like you mentioned rage. People go into a rage sometimes. And their behavior is things that Sometimes 90% of people would never do. So once you recognize that pattern, you know you're dealing with a high conflict personality, which, as you said, is about 10% of the population. Uh, we've been working at this now for about 15 years, and in every setting, we see high conflict people. So what we're looking at is this pattern of behavior that you should today be a little more prepared for. And of course, in this podcast, we're going to give you a lot of tips. So be prepared and recognize this pattern. Blaming others, all or nothing thinking, unmanaged emotions, and extreme behaviors sometimes, like sending the, the email that shouldn't be sent, public shaming. And, and one thing to, to mention here is they're everywhere every country, and we've been to a lot of countries, every continent, uh, every state, so every occupation, some have a little more, some have a little less. But what we're seeing today is they're really everywhere. And if you start becoming aware, not only will you recognize them, but you'll also realize you have to adapt your own approach to how to deal with them. I see HCP as sort of um, an equal opportunity. As you're saying, we see them in every country, every income strata. There, it's, it doesn't matter the background, um, the race, the gender, anything. It just, it, it's equal opportunity. So you really have to be aware. Number two, you said something interesting about predictability. As we go out and train and write our books and talk to people, what we often hear, as you know, is that People say, oh, these are the most unpredictable people on earth. But as we know, these, uh, once you understand their patterns of behavior and how to respond instead of react um, and respond with the right techniques, then um, they become really very, very predictable. So, Bill, 
Why are they like this? And why don't they connect the dots to their own behavior? We're talking about personality. Personality, really, all our personalities come from three things. One is our genetic tendencies that we have with us when we're born, some things that may pass through families back to the beginning of time. Also, early childhood, that's a real big factor in how personalities are developed the first five or six years. So things may happen then. For some people, that really teach them You know, the world isn't a safe place. You have to fight, fight, fight in every relationship. And we especially see this in close relationships. So boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, parent, child, close friends, close neighbors, anybody you're close to, there's that chance that this is going to come out. And so what what we see is they've got maybe a genetic tendency early childhood, especially about close relationships. But the third is really the culture that you're raised in. And so with culture, you see people are really kind of absorbing a little bit what's around them. And the example I like to give about explaining how culture works is think about people who were born like in 1920. People that were born in 1920 Within a few years, we're going to be facing the Great Depression. Then a few years after that, going to be facing World War II. And they lived in a society where people weren't allowed to really focus on themselves. You got to help each other out. They grew up in large families, you know, four, six, eight, 12 kids. Um, And so the culture influenced people's personality development. So they didn't talk a lot about themselves. They knew they had to take care of each other. And they worked hard. They could have a job their whole life and then get a a pension. And many people refer to that generation as the greatest generation. But now picture, let's say you're born in 1980. Well, 1980s, when the personal computer came out, You've got to learn how to use all of these technological devices. You're also growing up in a family that had birth control. So you're growing up with one or two siblings, perhaps, rather than eight or 12. And so what you learned is you have to promote yourself. You're not going to get a job for sure. You've got to sell people on hiring you. And so you can see the cultural influence. So today we have to talk about ourselves more and we spend more time alone. And so that's influenced personalities to some extent. But remember all three parts, genetic tendency, early childhood, as well as culture. So what we're seeing with this maybe 10% of people today really depends on the person. But it's a combination of that. Some just have a, we're born to be nasty. And there's a percent of people like that. Some learn that in their early childhood because nasty things happen to them. And in today's culture, it's all your fault is one of the messages that we pay attention to. We go, oh, that's exciting. And so high conflict people seem to come from this combination of difficulty and the way we manage them, we have to shift our own behavior. Let's talk a minute about why they do say that it's all someone else's fault. They seem to externalize and take a victim role. And I think that's confusing to to people, like how it, it feels so strongly within themselves that it is someone else's fault. Yeah, and that's really psychological. And that gets into psychology. And one thing we'll talk about um, in in these podcasts is personality disorders. So that some people are really born unable to look at their own part. Some people learn that in early childhood. And of course, our culture reinforces not taking responsibility. So it's really connecting the dots as an issue. And you can't make them connect the dots. And that's so important to know that you don't say, oh, can't you see? It's really all your fault because you did this yesterday and that's why it happened. You don't want to go there. What you want to do 
is talk about problem solving. And we'll, we'll give you a lot of tips for that. But it's that inability to reflect on their own behavior. And 90% of people are constantly going, oops, what's my part in this problem? Oops, what should I do differently? And that's how human beings get along. But if you don't do that, then you're not going to get along well with people. And one of the sad things is high-conflict people often don't have many real friends because they've alienated the people around them because they don't take responsibility for solving relationship problems. And they're so preoccupied with blaming that they really push people away. It's sad and it's unfortunate. And I think one of the hardest things to do it, when dealing with HCPs is to understand that the feelings are str so strong within them that they do believe it's your fault, even when you know it's not, or when you're being falsely accused. They truly believe this. And no amount of explaining, arguing, or cajoling, <laughs> or telling others um, will get them to change their mind. It makes them more defensive. So right. that's why you don't want to point that out to them. And that's probably the big red light alarm to give people right from the start is don't tell high conflict people you think they're high conflict people. You and I have both said that to so many people and then they do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You know, I recall someone coming to to us for some advice and so, some help with a divorce situation. And he asked me if I would uh, thought it was a good idea to send a bunch of books about borderline personality disorder to his um, soon to be ex-wife's entire family, a copy per person. And I said, absolutely don't do that. That's the worst idea ever. It's going to backfire. Do you think he did it? Yes, he did. <laughs> did it backfire? Yes, it did. Uh, and he sent one to his, his soon-to-be ex-wife as well. So he wanted her to know she had a problem. And uh, he, he really wasn't looking inward at all. And so maybe perhaps he had his own HCP going on as well. But what you've said is important. You kind of have to stop yourself before you tell someone that you think they have a high conflict personality. You have to stop yourself before telling other people that you think that person has a, a, a high conflict personality. So it's really important for us to um, be aware uh, of how to avoid labeling and diagnosing um, someone, you know, saying they have a, a high conflict personality or a personality disorder. So how do you avoid doing that? Instead of doing those things to avoid, as you're saying, what we need to do is a set of things that address their difficulties. And one of the things that we've developed are, are techniques. We've developed several techniques, and they're actually each one pretty simple, but it takes a lot of practice. So, for example, one is you can calm the person down by giving them what we call an ear statement that shows empathy, attention, or respect. And so you think of something that connects with what they're experiencing or what they're feeling. So you might say, yeah, I felt that way too sometimes. Or I'll pay attention. Tell me more. I want to understand. Or, you know, I really respect how hard you've been working on this project. And by the way, you can use this tool in families, you can use it at work, you can use it with neighbors, friends, strangers. Um, it's just a, a identify one thing that you can acknowledge for them is give them empathy. Yeah, I can see you're having a hard time, or I know this is a difficult situation. It just calms people like within 30 seconds most of the time. So empathy, or I'll pay attention, tell me more, or I respect this thing, you know, that you're doing or that you've done, or your commitment to solving a problem. And it tends to calm down high conflict people. You can also use it with anybody. And we'll explain that all our techniques you can use with anybody, even children, even teenagers, and of course, spouses. Um, but don't overuse these. Uh, occasionally, I find myself saying something and going, Bill, don't use that technique on me. 
And I know what you're up to. <laughs> but most of the time, it really helps calm people down because you're not fighting with them. When you think of it, this is a real easy concept. Think of, of what we want to do in relationships as win-win. And high conflict people think in terms of win-lose. If I don't win this over the other person, then, they're, then I'm a loser and they're winning this over me. And in close relationships, it really needs to be win-win if anybody's going to stick around. So that's the idea is act in a win-win way and you often can calm down a high conflict person by giving them empathy, attention and respect. It's hard to do that sometimes because we're we are in that that moment, right? And we're not expecting it. Now, sometimes it, after we've learned how to use ear statements um, and we're at work or we're giving a consultation or working with an employee or a spouse or whomever, um, we we might be in a good state of mind um, and a state of awareness to use your statements when someone else is blaming us or being defensive or uh, just being hostile in general or, you know, kind of undermining. <laughs> so um, it can be easier, I should say, in those situations when we have awareness and we're being disciplined enough to use them. But what happens when we are taken by surprise? And that happens sometimes, right? We go to the store and uh, what we expect, a simple interaction. And so our guard is down and someone gets, you know, kind of nasty with us and uh, we might get nasty right back. And there's that win, win, lose that we're talking about. So it really becomes a matter of adapting what we do because they can't. That's a really hard concept for people to understand that they aren't going to adapt what they do. And so we must in order to have that win-win. So we're going to slip up sometimes. I still do. It's not a perfect science or, or I guess a perfect practice. It works every time when we use it, but sometimes we we forget to use it or we just slip up or or we get a little hooked. So you want to explain hooked, Bill? So what happens is, and this gets We'll just go a little bit into the brain here. But people have heard of the amygdala, and that's in the middle part of your brain. And the amygdala is always keeping watch for danger. And so what happens is when high-conflict people come on, they often come on with unmanaged emotions. And those emotions hook your amygdala, and next thing you know, you're in fight, flight, or freeze mode. And so even before you can think, because your amygdala gets a message before your thinking brain. And so what happens is you're ready to fight. It's like, wait a minute, buddy, you're the one who's an idiot. And, and the words are coming out of your mouth before you realize, oops, this is going to backfire. I need to shift myself. And as you said, Megan, it's really adapting our own behavior. We're not going to control them, but by adapting our response and by calming our own amygdala and saying, hang on, it's a high conflict person. Not now. We're not going to fight. We're going to give them empathy, attention, and respect, which is the exact opposite of what your amygdala wants you to do. But you'll find it works a whole lot better because the amygdala, you know, is a fighter but doesn't necessarily uh, think things through. The amygdala doesn't connect the dots. The amygdala just reacts. So that's, that's why you find yourself when you're caught by surprise and why you want to practice. Because what's interesting, you can train your amygdala to not react in some situations. And, and they actually say, there's another little tidbit here, that the adolescent brain isn't really fully developed till about 25, and that this part is one of the last parts to really fully develop. And that is for the, the teenager's brain to be able to tell himself or herself, this isn't a crisis. You don't have to go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. So this is a really good skill for teenagers to learn. They'll make more mistakes, but by the time they're 25, and in the coming world, the way we have so much conflict, they're going to do really well if they can learn to say, hang on, amygdala, 
it's only a high conflict person. We're going to give them an air statement and that'll calm things down. Yeah, it's a simple technique, um, just kind of hard to do without a lot of practice and really recognizing when you're hooked and, you know, your heart rate may be up a little bit or your body feels tense or you, you feel like arguing or explaining a lot or running away, right? Conflict avoiders. Let me go back to my story about the highest conflict person in the room that we started this episode with. Was I dealing with a high conflict situation? Was I dealing with a high conflict person? So number one, was I being blamed? Yes. This person was blaming me for wasting their time, their money. Uh, number two, did the person display unmanaged emotions? Yes, indeed. <laughs> the red face, the, you know, there's a little spit coming out even. So, yep, unmanaged emotions. Number three, was the person displaying extreme behaviors? Uh, yes, merely by getting in my face and yelling in front of a whole room full of other, you know, training participants. That's rather extreme. And number four was was the person uh, exhibiting all or nothing thinking, and I would say yes because there was there was so much um, intense emotion in that moment, and it was you are going to do it my way or the highway. So let's talk about how I handled it. In the moment, I was taken a little by surprise. And I was in fight or flight, most definitely. My amygdala, who I have nicknamed Miggy, uh, was in fight or flight. And I just wasn't able to think clearly. I, I just, I froze. And now I have to, you know, respond to someone with an ear statement to calm them in front of a room full of people that I'm going to train on this technique in about five minutes. <laughs> now I'm under pressure. I'm under stress because when, when that amygdala is is activated, I tell you, you're you're really stressed and you can't think. So you kind of go into this primal, defensive, explaining, arguing mode. And I'm an explainer by nature, so I explained to her this person that I was repeating information from the previous day's training because there were new people in today's training because that was the, the complaint. And they said, well, I don't care about them. You should respect me. I was here yesterday and I'm here today for all new training material. So that's when I had my aha moment <laughs> and was able to pull it together enough to give an ear statement while looking directly into their face and using a calm tone of voice. And I said, oh, ah, I get it now. I understand. So how about this? In the next section that starts in about five minutes, I'll be giving all new information. So I think you're really going to like that. So if you just hang on a little bit longer, I think I think you'll be, you know, it'll be good. So the person kind of huffed a little bit and kind of walked back into the, the training room. After the seminar, they came up and, and shook my hand and with a big smile said, thank you. You know, and I had nothing but empathy for the person because I understood that they were just in that, you know, upset emotion in that moment and couldn't stop themselves. And it felt very normal to come and uh, kind of attack me, right? They couldn't stop themselves. So my ear statement worked. And it was a really good example, hopefully, to the rest of the people that were, were watching um, on how to use ear statements to calm people. So that's kind of an introduction to HCPs and, and a simple technique for interacting with them. Um, Bill, I think you have an example from your new book, Calming Upset People with Ear, about using ear statements. This is an example in the workplace. This, this book, we've got over 30 examples. So I'll just talk about this one. But what's interesting is on our website at highconflictinstitute.com, the most popular article is dealing with your narcissistic boss. And so I'll give you an example. I'm not diagnosing the boss, but they probably were a high conflict person, which, by the way, isn't a diagnosis, but still don't tell anybody. So in this consultation situation, this was a new boss. So she'd been working at her job for many years, just a year from retirement with a full pension. Her department manager changed. 
the new boss, for some reason, decided to pick on Lori and criticized her frequently, including in front of other employees. She sought a consultation for tips on how to deal with the boss. So she said, the boss criticizes me when she sees me. So when I come to work, I try to sneak past her office into my own office and shut the door. But I know this isn't a long-term solution. I try to change jobs, but I'm just a year away from full retirement. I just want to hang on, but without the harassment. First of all, as I gave Lori an air statement and told her, I can really understand how frustrating and scary that is. And that's the empathy part. But then what I suggested is that she does the opposite, that she engage with her with the supervisor. And at the beginning of the day, don't rush to hide in her office. Pop your head in the supervisor's office and say, hi, how you doing? I really like that, pro- that presentation you did on Friday or how's your weekend? And then give a response that shows empathy, attention, and respect to her boss. And she did this and then would say, you know, just take like 30 seconds or a minute and say, well, I'm going to get on to work. Those tasks you need me to get done and go off to her office without rushing or hiding. After about 30 days, about a month, she said, guess what, Bill? I'm now her favorite. (laughs) And she doesn't pick on me anymore because, and she actually comes to me and complains about other people, which I try to be very neutral about. And she said, but there's another guy in the office now that she's picking on. So I gave that guy one of your books. (laughs) But the idea is, and it's not guaranteed, we don't guarantee any of our techniques, but they work generally more than 90% of the time. The idea was she changed her own behavior, and that was calming to her boss. And her boss liked that, and her boss seemed like a high-conflict person from everything I was told. And high conflict people don't get much empathy, attention, and respect. So she really soaked it up and appreciated that. So I like that example because it really primarily seemed to be ear statements that made the big difference there. So again, not guaranteed, but hey, it works. Yeah, and the great thing is, it costs you nothing. Yes. <laughs> and yes. It, it saves so much time. Every, anyone who's who's dealt with at HCP uh, knows how much time can be lost in trying to figure out how to respond or in long drawn out fights or uh, things like that. But a simple little ear statement can calm the situation, calm the person, and you can move on about your day. And the great thing is it's way less stressful for you. (laughs) So you've got to make sure you're unhooked and just practice, you know, be disciplined to use ear statements. That was it. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks for listening through to the end. And we hope that something in this episode helps you connect the dots about high conflict people and to also find the missing piece. We want to leave you with two simple reminders. One, when dealing with HDPs, do the opposite of what you feel like doing and what you're used to doing with everyone else. And two, please don't ever tell anyone you think they are high conflict or have a high conflict personality. It's simple, but sometimes hard to do. In next week's episode, we'll talk about how to respond to HDPs in writing with a little technique that Bill created called BIF response. That's B-I-F-F. It's one of our most popular techniques. So it's about, uh, as I said, responding in writing, whereas with ear statements, we are responding in uh, verbal situations. Hang in there and we'll see you next time on It's All Your Fault. It's All Your Fault is a production of True Story FM. Engineering by Andy Nelson. Music by Wolf Samuels, John Coggins, and Ziv Moran. Find the show, show notes, and transcripts at truestory.fm or highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. Our show.